Hi and welcome to my studio. Today we will talk about the lost art of composition. Well, at least the more traditional methods of composition that are today a lost art. We will understand what is a composition and learn to ask two important questions that will help us describe what we need to consider in our own composition. We will talk about mathematics, geometry, music, philosophy, and how are they related to this whole subject. We will also uncover the hidden secrets of composition from the Middle Ages to the present day. And of course, how does all of this can help you in your own work? So let's get started. If you are new to this channel, please consider subscribing and liking this video. So what is actually a composition? Composition is basically how to arrange multiple objects in a way that will be aesthetic, harmonious and interesting. This arrangement will help us to direct the viewer or listener to our main topics. Composition is actually found in every aspect of human life as well as in nature. If we take architecture as an example, we can look at how buildings are built and arranged so the viewer concentrates on the points the architect leads them to. For example, a building with circular stairs that attract us to look up. When in the center of the ceiling there is glass that reveals daylight or starlight or some nice picture or painting, the architect leads the visitor to look at it using the circular stairs. Basically, there are two main ways that artists approach painting. One is through intuition. That is, we aim the camera, for example, take a few pictures and select one that looks good to us and decide to paint it. The second way is using a more methodic way. Paying attention to the composition can dramatically improve the end result of your painting. The use of the classical method of composition is disappearing and we will see in this video how it changes over the years. When we look at a composition in painting, we ask ourselves two important questions. The first is what do we want to say? What is our big idea? What is the message we want to convey through our painting? This is an important question as usually we do not start painting without any plan ahead. The second question is how do we convey this message to the viewer? How will we organize the elements within the painting in the way that the message that we want will lead the viewer to what we want to say? Well, one common way is with the help of lines and geometry. Let's see an example of this. What we see here is a painting called the Vassarvas Calvary. This painting is medieval, a little pre-Renaissance. This painting is from the 15th century. The artist depicts in this painting the crucifixion of Jesus. So as we said, the first question is, what is the idea? Well, the idea here is obviously the crucifixion of Christ. The second question is, how is this message being conveyed? This painting focuses our attention immediately to the crucified Christ at the center of the painting. So how is it done? Notice how he divided this painting into four equal parts in vertical lines. The middle line cuts Jesus right in the center. The circle sits exactly on the sides of this triangle. The figures who are close to Jesus are within this circle. This placement draws our eyes to those specific figures. The base of this triangle cuts the midline exactly at this point. And what we see there is the crucified feet of Jesus. Additionally, the line that represents the base of the triangle gives us the third top of the painting. And basically, the main characters that we are directed to them 
and want to look at them. Notice the red square. One of the sides of this square creates a parallel line to the triangle. The artist placed the supporting characters in between those lines. Note that even horses and people, everyone is pushed into this area. On the other side, we see that the crucified man is placed on the line of this square. When we look at this painting, we actually gravitate toward the center and we try to understand how and what exactly is happening there. The artist draws us into the center of the painting because that's what he wants us to focus on. And this was done using the, this geometrical technique. Now, over the years, we see in the paintings themselves and in the preliminary sketches of the artists, the very marks of the composition on the canvas and the paper. During the Renaissance, the idea of composition changed. Over the years, mathematicians, architects, philosophers, etc. have tried to find a connection between music and composition in general and in painting in particular. So Newton, for example, tried to build the color wheel according to the seven musical notes from Do to C. He tried to create some kind of connection. This connection didn't work so well, and artists didn't use it over the years. But the interesting understanding of the connection between music and composition in painting started actually in the 15th century with the movement of people called Albertism. We will not go into the explanation of this group, a fascinating and amazing group in itself. I will just say about this group that it was a group of philosophers and theologians uh, founded to protect Aristotle's writing. In this movement, they wrote three books published in Latin in Florence in 1485. The third book was common in the studios of all artists. The book dealt with the connection between composition and music and aesthetics in painting. In the fifth chapter of this book, the correlation of musical intervals and the harmony or disharmony they create. Harmonic intervals such as the fifth, fourth, octave, quintus, quartets. By the way, if you don't know music theory, don't worry. It's not really important for our purpose. What is important is that those who understand a little about music theory can understand that there is a close relationship between music and composition in painting. In any case, Albertini found that the proportions of division of these interval to two, three, and four create wonderful harmony and strengthen our composition in painting. This is also true in architecture and in sculpture. Let's see an example of how the great master Sandro Botticelli, who was a follower of this theory, use it in his very famous painting, The Birth of Venus. I guess you all know this painting. This painting is very famous. It was actually a breakthrough in many ways. At the beginning of the Renaissance period, it has been produced entirely from Botticelli's wonderful imagination. When I saw this painting on my last visit to Florence, I just sat there for a long time and I looked at this painting because there are so many amazing things in it. And among other things, there is this matter of composition. I want you to notice the tilt of the body of Venus, which is in the center. Note that this tilt seems comfortable and pleasant to us and calm. She's a bit shy, but note that her center of gravity is unnatural. If you try to place a model in this pose, she would not really be able to stand. This is an angle that is unnatural. 
But in the painting, it feels right to us. Let's look at the musical division of this painting and try to understand it for a moment. Basically, what we see here is that the angle of her body sits exactly on the musical line in a ratio of 9 to 16. I am talking about this line, the central line, the line that cuts through her body. Notice the pair of nymphs sitting on the left side in the painting. How do they sit exactly inside this triangle? It's something that comes from here, from the center, above her head, and splits in both directions. And it actually creates the movement that we see here. If you look carefully in the painting, you will see that the nymphs blowing towards Venus and essentially pushing her body to the angle of her posture. Notice that all the lines come out of this point and are divided exactly in the musical way of a ratio of 9 to 16. Also, notice this central line that cuts Venus exactly at the belly button. And it is no accident that it is there. So actually, it is important to understand that there are no coincidences. There is an orderly planning of this whole composition. I want to show you another example that can be seen in a Raphael painting. Raphael was known to prefer simple methods. He always wanted to simplify things as much as possible and not complicate it. In his painting, the portrait of John of Aragon that we see here, we can see the use of his musical composition in a very clear way. He, of course, also used more Caravaginistic lighting, lighting that comes from the world of Caravaggio. He also subtly used Leonardo technique, and you can see it here, in this area of her chest. In fact, something very similar to what da Vinci did in his famous Mona Lisa. These things are not accidental. They are very planned, and they come from a very organized thinking. Her posture is in a very special angle. This angle is actually built on the line of 8 to 12, and that's actually an octave line. And that's how we can actually see John of Argon arranged in a very nice and clear way. This wonderful theme that dominated the Renaissance period and after, so until now, we have looked at a composition that comes from geometric shapes and mathematical and musical relations. Let's look at a composition from a lighting perspective that is beyond the location of the figures and other objects on the canvas. We can also use color, light, and dark values to direct the viewer to what we want. Let's look for a moment at Rembrandt's wonderful painting, one of my favorite paintings. This painting is called The Philosopher in Meditation. Notice how Rembrandt uses a very basic palette. There are not many colors here that will distract our attention. Notice how we are drawn to the philosopher and look at him. Actually, the light that comes from outside is a warm light. It makes us feel calm, like a wise man in meditation. Very comfortable and pleasant feeling. The spiraling movement of the stairs pulls us to another area, to a quiet area that is a mystery to us. We don't know exactly what's going on there. It's like something very mysterious. We want to look inside to understand what exactly is happening there. We can see here on this side a very small and somewhat hidden figure that we have in this area. It is actually a figure of a person who arranges the fire to heat the room. Pay attention to this plate. Let's understand its placement in the painting. If we draw a line in the center of the painting and another line horizontally in the center, the intersection of these lines is at the center of the plate. Placing a diagonal line from the upper right corner creates a triangle which places the main figure, the philosopher, in it. 
So using light and geometric lines in this painting, Rembrandt focuses our attention on the main character. I want to show you another really beautiful and important example. This is a composition that is using a light technique to focus our attention. The artist is Gerardo delle Notti. His famous painting, The Adoration of Baby Jesus. I saw this painting on my last visit to Florence in Italy, in the Uffizi Museum. I have to tell you that I was standing next to this painting for longer than an hour. Beyond Gerardo, incredible technique and abilities, we see here practically everything related to composition. We also see the Caravaginistic use here that I spoke about earlier. Using the chiaroscuro technique, we see the dark area behind the illuminated figures. We see the divine light of the baby Jesus projected from him to the people around him. This technique draws the viewer to the baby. If we will return for a moment to the two questions we asked at the beginning of this video, we ask, what did the artist want to say? Well, in this case, he wants to say that Jesus is a divine being. This is the message he wants to deliver to us. How does he say that? He shows that the baby Jesus is illuminated in divine holiness. He is divine and he illuminates those around with warm holy light. When you paint, you should think of how to focus the viewer to the main point in your painting. Well, there are so many more composition techniques to talk about, and maybe I'll do it in another video. Feel free to let me know in your comments if you would like to learn more on that subject. Today, composition is done with a camera. Most people just take pictures of what seems beautiful and aesthetic to them, and they use this as a reference to their work. There is nothing wrong with it, of course. Life is progressing, and new technology is everywhere. Classical art gives way to modern and contemporary art. And the tools we used in the past gives way to new tools. And besides, what is beauty or aesthetics? These are terms of fashion and culture, and they change over time. So what used to be considered beautiful in the Middle Ages is not necessarily considered beautiful today. I hope you enjoyed this and please feel free to comment and let me know your thoughts or if you have any questions. See you in the next video.